Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. This is getting to the, the practical section of Ephesians where uh, Paul says, in, in light of who we are in Christ, in light of what Christ has done for us, in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, how should we live? Let us read now, beginning with verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Keep your Bibles open before you. This is God's word. Let us pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks for uh, how your word speaks to where we are uh, every day of our lives. Lord, we pray that we would uh, be like Samuel and we would say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This comes under the category of there's nothing new under the sun. I saw a drawing the other day of a very strange looking Greek statue. And the statue had a man with wings on his feet, not here, but on his feet, wings on his feet, a very large Elvis Presley bouffant hair sticking out this way and bald in the back. And beneath the statue is this inscription. It's using old archaic language. It says, Who made thee? Well, Lysippus made thee. What is thy name? My name is Opportunity. Why hast thou wings on thy feet? That I may fly away swiftly. Why hast thou a great forelock? That men may seize me when I arrive. Why art thou bald in the back? So that when I'm gone by, no one can lay hold of me. Message, very simple. Opportunity speeds by every day. That Greek statue, that inscription reminds us of a Latin phrase, tempus fugit, time flies. And to be honest, so do we. Most of us seem to be busy and always in a hurry. We walk fast, we talk fast, we eat fast, and after we eat, we stand up and we say, excuse me, i got to run. The words of Will Rogers, great American humorist, we're the only country in the world that has a mountain by the name of Rushmore. <laughs> As Chuck Swindoll said, there's three words that describe our life today. The words are this. Hurry, worry, and bury. So here we are. People who are in a hurry. But not only are we in a hurry, but have you noticed it's Sunday? And before you know it, it's Sunday again. Time flies. And while time flies, the Greek statue reminds us that, that opportunities speed by us. And the message from this text this morning is this. That God wants us to take three looks, three looks at the time and the opportunities that God gives us in time. Notice it says, look carefully uh, how you walk. Uh, literally, that's walk looking all around. Three looks. First look is this. God wants you to look at the time you have. That's the first look. God wants you to look at the time you have. As we walk down life's pathway to the forest of our years in this fallen, fragile, post-Genesis uh, 3 world, our tempest is fugiting. To tweak the tagline on a number of advertisements, life is a limited time opportunity. Scriptures agree. Psalm 39.4, Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. That's Psalm 
39, 4. Psalm 90, 10. The length of our days is 70 years, 80 if we have the strength. Then they quickly pass and I fly away. Now for you younger people, I understand 70, 80 years seems like a long, long time in the future. I still remember, barely, in my teens and 20s when I really thought that everyone over 60 was a fossil. No longer, because I am a fossil. All that age stuff is really relative. And not only is age relative, but time is relative. You know, for a couple of amorous, love-struck teenagers parked outside in the driveway talking, two hours is a blink of an eye. But you look at poor mom and dad inside waiting in the house, and those two hours are an eternity. Whatever your perspective, you need to realize your time on this earth is limited, and time is fleeting. It's fleeting faster than a Japanese bullet train traveling at 200 miles an hour. You blink your eye, time flies faster than a skittish deer bolts when he hears a sudden noise or a sound. Now, have you ever wondered, have you ever wondered why time seems to grow faster as you get older? You notice that? It really does. I read an article back in 2013 that I saved. 2013 was yesterday for me. And it offers this insight. Now listen carefully, bear with me, because this best explanation I've heard of why time seems to speed by as you get older. He says, there are a number of good explanations for why time feels to be speeding up with age. But the most objective and therefore the most measurable explanation is found in the ratio of time to life. As a percentage of our life, each new moment is less than the one before. For instance, a year when we were one was the whole of our life. When we turned two, a year was half our life. When we turned three, a year is a third of our life. You do the math. With each passing year, newer moments are simply compressed to a greater degree. This increasing compression is what gives us the perception that time is speeding up. You think that an 18-year-old is guaranteed to live to the ripe old age of 99 would have a great deal of life to live. But when adjusted for experience... This 18-year-old has slightly less than 20 minutes left. Two-thirds of their experience has passed between birth and 18. It's not that the clock is speeding up. It's the declining portion of time we feel with each experience. The author quotes uh, Henry Twell's Time Paces. You've, you've heard this poem. When as a youth I waxed more bold, time strolled. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. When older still I daily grew, time flew. Soon I shall find in passing on, time gone. See, now we see the divine wisdom in Psalm 90, verse 12. Teach us to number our days that we will develop a heart of wisdom. It's wise to realize that the sands of time are not just sinking, the sands of time are free-falling through the hourglass of our lives. And here's the kicker. We have no guarantee that we will have even one more day to live. Your life can be taken from you quicker than a sneeze. An aneurysm, a drunk driver swerving into your lane, a heart attack, a virus and the dash, on the tombstone between the day of your birth and the day of your death will be as quick as snapping your fingers. Remember what Jesus said to the rich fool? Tonight, your soul will be required of you. Friends, we all know people, friends and family, celebrities who've been snatched from us as unexpectedly as a wallet snatched by a professional pickpocket. Friends, we get it. 
I hope we get it, when, when James, the half-brother of Jesus, says this, he talks about making plans. You know, we make plans. Yes, we should make plans, but James in James 4.15 says, instead of saying, I'm going to do this, 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 and this, I'm going to enter in this business, I'm going to buy this, I'm going to do this, we should preface it with, if the Lord wills, I will do thus and so. One of our elders who's now gone to be with the Lord, Lonnie Smith, every time I'd part from him, I'd say, Lonnie, we'll see you tomorrow. And he would always say, God willing, God willing. The Puritans would fill their speech, their correspondence, with, with the Latin phrase, Deo Valente, God willing. They would send out announcements. They would send out letters, and they would put on the bottom of the announcement, D-V, Deo Valente. Not talking in cliché, but people created by God, sustained by divine life support by God, we need to acknowledge always whose will will prevail. Friends, the past is past. God and God alone knows the future. What you have is now. Don't bank on tomorrow. Say, you have something you need to say? Say what needs to be said now. Do what needs to be done now. Speak that word of grace that you've been meaning to speak to someone else now. You know, a basic principle of marketing is when a commodity is a limited commodity, that commodity becomes more valuable. Our time on this earth as we know it is limited. God wants us to look at the time we have. Notice he talks about making the best use of the time. In other words, the time we have. Realize the value of this incredible gift of time that God gives you. And realize it's going to go by faster and faster and faster. Second look at time is this. Not only does God want you to look at the time you have, but notice God wants you to look at the opportunities you have. God wants you to look at the opportunities you have. Making the best use or making the most opportune use of the time. That is the time you have. And notice why here. Because the days are evil. Friends, that's a reminder to us that, that Satan is a robber. He's a thief. The devil wants to rob you of one of your most precious commodities, and that's time. But the Lord wants you to redeem and steward this precious gift of time that you have. You know, in his later years, Malcolm Muggeridge became a Christian. But in his early years, Muggeridge was not a Christian. He wrote a book about his B.C. days, and the title of the book, appropriately, was this, Chronicles of Wasted Time. Reminds me of the Freddie Fender song, Wasted Days and Wasted Nights. That book, that song, fits. Think of the time you've wasted. Wasted in shallow relationships, wasted in gossiping, spreading rumors, bound with the chains of anxiety, getting time trapped in the news feed and our Facebook pages, getting all bent out of shape about the latest Twitter feed, TikTok video, news headline. Sin is always making demands on our time. But it's not just sin that makes demand on our times. Good things also make demands on our time. Remember when Jesus visited the home of Mary and Martha? Jesus sits down to teach. Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet like a dry sponge, drinking in every word that Jesus said. At the same time, Martha was a perpetual motion machine, preparing dinner. You know the story. Martha gets all bent out of shape. Mary's MIA in the kitchen. Martha whines, Lord, why don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell Mary to help me. Jesus didn't say, okay, okay. No, it's not what he said. Remember what Jesus said? He said, Martha, Martha. You're worried, you're upset about many things. But only one thing is needed. 
Mary has chosen what is the better thing. And what Mary has chosen will not be taken from her. Now, was, was Martha sinning by preparing a meal in the kitchen? Of course not. The problem is this. Martha was so preoccupied with doing a good thing that Martha did not redeem the opportunity to spend time with God himself. God in her living room. And she's fussing all about. But hey, let's, let's not point fingers. We make the same mistake every day. You know what it's called, don't you? It's the tyranny of the urgent. We fail to invest our time in things that have eternal value. Friends, let me encourage you from God's word to look for opportunities to give you. And here's why. Every person you meet this week is delta-rich soil in which to sow good seed. The good seed of the gospel, a Barnabas word of encouragement, a good Samaritan helping hand. We need to walk through each day the way a doctor makes round seeing a patient in every room, a patient needing care and help. Imitate your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Go about doing good. Every situation you're in, you need to see it as a greenhouse opportunity for you to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but you need to especially prize the Lord's day because Sundays have green thumb potential through worship and preaching. Potential to grow you like kudzu on a Mississippi hillside. Listen, if you don't honor God with your use of time, you will suffer the consequences. There's a medical doctor by the name of Richard Swenson. He wrote a book entitled Margin. Swenson discusses that one of the major maladies of our day is something called overload. Uh, people are just plain overloaded. Overloaded with commitments, possessions, work, information. And he says, and I quote, in the process of being overloaded with so many things, the result is this. We suffer. We suffer emotionally. We suffer relationally. We suffer spiritually. We always suffer. Our time plates are piled so high with so many demands, so many good things to be done. You know, there's about 4,000 hours left in this year. And by this time next Sunday, you'll have burned through the currency of 168 hours. We call it spending time because once spent, that time is gone. How will you spend those hours? Will you make the most of every opportunity? Now, I'm about to tell you something. That if you discuss this, what I'm fixing to say at the table today... I can pretty much guarantee you, you'll defend the church. You probably shouldn't. Most controversial thing I may say in a while, but I want you to listen. Here it is. You know, these, these evil days, Dr. Jimmy Allen is the former pastor of First Baptist Church, San Antonio, Texas. Here's what he writes. We missed him. Our chance to change things came and passed, and we did not know it was there. A little boy sat through Sunday school classes for three years in our church. Three years, and we missed him. His name? Sirhan Sirhan. And at age 24, that young man shot and killed Senator Robert Kennedy. And the welter of words, the shudder of grief throughout the nation, the persistent thought kept recurring in our church. He was an opportunity. And we missed him. We missed him. We look at the time we have. We look at the opportunities we have. And notice in the third place, the third look is this. 
God wants us to look to the Lord. God wants us to look to the Lord. Notice, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, what do you think the will of the Lord is for you? Well, does the Lord want your mind to be so saturated with worries, so strangled with anxieties, that you send God to the back of the bus? Do you, do you think the Lord wants your calendar, your schedule so crowded that you don't make time for what's important? What do you think the Lord's will is for you these days? Let me give you a simple guideline. Here it is. Jot down this verse. Genesis 39, 2. Because if you're a believer, that verse is a one-line biography of you. And here's what it reads. You ready? Your one-line biography is the same as Joseph's. Genesis 39, 2. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. Like the promise of Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Lo, I'm with you always. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. I will never leave you or forsake you. Friends, every day of your life, every moment of your life, every second of your life, the Lord is present with you. He's there to help you like a lifeguard on the beach, like those blue-vested men and women at Walmart, like those doctors in the emergency room. And if you believe that God is present in your life, and He's as close to you, closer than your shadow, here's something you will do. You will cultivate the habit of praying to God. And you will pray your way through every day. From the time you get up until the time you go to bed, you will talk to the Lord the way teenagers text. You know how that is, repeatedly, briefly, and pointedly. Walk through your day. You will redeem the time. You will profit from the opportunities God gives you. Of course, praying assumes that you've answered in a positive way the, the core question, who or what is most important in my life? Hopefully your answer is my relationship with God through Jesus Christ, because if you mean that, if you mean that your relationship with God through Christ is most important, then that will be at the top of your pyramid of priorities. It will affect every decision you make. It will affect how you schedule the time that God gives you. It will affect your relationship. It will affect your whole outlook on life. And again, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but if you believe that God is top of the pyramid of priorities, when Sunday rolls around, neither rain nor snow nor sunshine nor football nor extracurriculars will interfere with worship in God's house on Sunday because... Sunday's the first day. We give God the first fruit of our week. The Indianapolis 500 race that is every week of our life, Sunday is the pace setter lap. We resolve, I will worship the Lord and nothing will interfere. First priority, God. Another priority is this. God wants you to invest time in your family. Invest time in your relationship with God. Invest time in your family. I love this statement by Lee Iacocca. Some of you may remember who he, who he was. He said, and I quote, he said, I've never once heard a CEO on their deathbed say these words. Gee, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. Husbands, do you, does your wife know that next to the Lord himself that she is the most important person in your life? Would your wife testify that you nourish and cherish her? Parents, spend time with your children. Time. See, for children, L-O-V-E is, is spelled T-I-M-E. Don't let time with your children slip through your fingers. Don't be like the absentee daddy on Cats in the Cradle. Listen to that song sometime. That's an absentee daddy. And he produced an absentee son for his children too. 
Next to your relationship with God through Christ, your family is right up there on the priority pyramid. And then there's work. You got your relationship with God, family, work, Colossians 3, 23, and 24. Whatever you do, do it with all your might as unto the Lord. He's your boss. You know, when someone hires a Christian, they should know they're hiring someone who is honest and hardworking and positive, not dishonest, lazy, and negative. We have an obligation to honor God in the workplace. One other priority I want to mention just briefly, and that's this. The priority of retuning our affections. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me ask you a question. Why is it that we struggle with sin? What is the primary reason sin out-arm wrestles us every time? Well, here it is. If sin held no attraction for us, sin would hold no power over us. Do you realize that? Sin is attractive to us. Sin promises, according to Hebrews, sin promises pleasure to us, but brings ultimately nothing but pain into our lives. That's why I'd urge you to read the very short sermon, at least short by the standards of that day, by Thomas Chalmers entitled The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. The only thing that's going to wrestle affection for the world away from you is the expulsive power of a new affection for the Lord God. Friends, when your love for the Lord exceeds all other loves, then pleasing the Lord will become the greatest pleasure in your life. There will be no greater pleasure than pleasing God. The year was 2006. There's an interview with Billy Graham. Question is asked, Reverend Graham, what are you most surprised at about this life? What most surprises you about this life? Two word answer, are you ready? What most surprises me about this life? It's Brevity. It's brevity. Now, Graham lived 99 years. Billy Graham always felt the sting of life's shortness. Beloved, in the power God's grace provides, let's look at this short time God gives us. Let's make the most of the opportunities God gives us in this time he gives us. And then let's, let's look to the Lord. Time? Whew. What you going to do with it? Let's pray. Lord, time is flying by. Opportunities are there. We know you are with us. We know you are most important. We know our spouses and our family, our work are important. Lord, help us to redeem the time, even as we retune our affections. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us conclude this morning as we stand and sing the doxology, praising God for all His good gifts, including the gift of time. Let us stand and sing. Thank you.